Hello, Humanities 8, and welcome to your Buddhism lecture. Uh, in ninth grade, when you start having lectures, you're not going to be able to have someone sitting in front taking down notes for you. You're just going to have to listen really closely to what the teacher says and try to write it down. Now here, I've still given you guided notes. And as I go through the lecture, you're gonna to need to go through them. Um, but you won't be able to see somebody on the screen under the dock arm writing the notes. Um, if you miss something, your substitute teacher has a answer key and she can, and you should just circle the, uh, circle the blank that you miss and after the lecture, you'll have some time to go back, um, take a look at the answer key, um, and fill that in. But until then, I want you to listen very closely to this lecture. I'll try to walk you through it as carefully as I can. Um, and we're going to talk about Buddhism. And our essential question with this is, how do we make it through the obstacles and challenges of high school? Um, but before we get into that essential question, we've got to talk about the basics of Buddhism. Now, this lecture has a couple of parts. The first part of this lecture is the history of Buddhism. So, Buddhism, like Hinduism, started in India. It was founded by a man named Siddhartha Gautama, who is also known as the Buddha around 600 BCE. Buddha means awakened one. Buddhism actually evolved from Hinduism. The Buddha was a Hindu prince, a kshatriya. And the difference where Buddhism starts to separate from Hinduism is that he and his friends rejected the leadership of the kings and the priests. As we know from our study of the caste system, those are the kshatriya and the brahmins. Um, in Hinduism, only the people at the top of society attain moksha. Only the people of the top of the society can attain moksha. If you're at the bottom, you need to have good karma and reincarnate and reincarnate and keep going higher up the caste system until you get to the top. And only then can you attain moksha. Early Buddhists said that all people can reach enlightenment, which they called nirvana. The early Buddhists were missionaries. This means that they are people who spread the teachings of the Buddha all around Asia. A missionary is a person who spreads a certain religion to a new place. Ashoka the Great was an emperor who converted to Buddhism and helped it spread even further. Now, Buddhism today is not as popular in India. But there are three denominations of Buddhists, and each lives in a different part of Asia. The Mahayana Buddhists live in China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Theravada Buddhists live in Southeast Asia. Vajrayana Buddhists live in Tibet. T-I-B-E-T, -E and Mongolia. And these last Buddhists, the Vajrayana Buddhists, are led by the Dalai Lama, who's a very famous figure. Um, but he's also very controversial. The Chinese government is not a big fan of him or the Tibetan Buddhists because they have been fighting, mostly with nonviolence, for independence of Tibet from China. If you take a look at the map, you'll see that the lightest color um, countries, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, those are the Mahayana countries 
if you look, the second lightest color are the Vajrayana countries, Mongolia and Tibet. And then Southeast Asia is the darkest color, um, which is where the home of Theravada Buddhism. On to the next page. In order to understand Buddhism, you need to understand the Buddha. And the second part of this lecture is going to be about the life of the Buddha. First, I want to talk a little bit about the Buddha's childhood. The Buddha was born as a prince. He lived a very wealthy and happy childhood. Par his parents, the king and queen, did not want him to see the suffering of the world. So they kept him in the palace walls. They tried to give him all the food and jewelry and treasures and relationships that he could desire, ever desire. He grew up and got married. But even as an adult, even when he was 28 years old, he had still not left the palace. But one day he got curious and he convinced um, one of his servants to help sneak him out of the palace. So eventually, the Buddha left the palace and was shocked by all of the suffering he saw. And there were four things in particular. These four things were called the four sights. The first was an old man. He'd never seen anyone old before, so he didn't know that the body changed and aged as it got older. The second sight was a sick man. Whenever someone had been sick in the palace, his parents had hidden, him, hidden them away from view, so the Buddha had no idea that people got sick. He had no idea that the ways people could suffer from illness and disease. The third sight that he saw was a corpse. He'd never seen a dead body. He didn't even know what death was. And the fourth sight was a holy man. And he'd never really see a holy man either. And you'll learn about why he'd never seen a holy man soon. But the holy man really inspired him. And after seeing these four sights, the Buddha wanted to find a way to end suffering in the world. He thought it was bad. He said, people suffer. That's not good. I want to find a way to fix this. So he decided to leave royalty behind. The Buddha left his family, including a wife and a child, to study with all other holy men who were known as ascetics. What's this word ascetic mean? This is a key word, ascetic. Ascetics are people who deprive themselves of food and water in order to attain enlightenment. So they say, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink. In some cases, I might, I'm not going to sleep. Sometimes they, they'll do things like they'll intentionally hurt themselves because they believe that through their suffering and pain, maybe they can find some source of wisdom about the world. And the Buddha studied with them for a while, but, and here's point number two under C, 2C, or C2, the Buddha thought eventually that starvation and thirst just created more suffering. And so he left the ascetics. He tried many types of meditation, but still he did not find an end to suffering. However, one day he reached nirvana. So this is a very important story. One day, the Buddha decided to sit under a Bodhi tree. This is a, it's a kind of tree, a fig tree actually. And he sat under the tree and he vowed that he would not move until he reached enlightenment. While he meditated, he was tempted by many demons to abandon his quest. He was had all kinds of thoughts about his life and the things that he wanted and the things that were, were bothering him, but he remained calm. Eventually, he attained enlightenment, which in Buddhism is called nirvana. 
N-I-R-V-A-N-A. And nirvana in Buddhism is very similar to moksha in Hinduism. It's about getting out of samsara, being free of the cycle of birth, death, and reincarnation. In Hinduism, you get out of this cycle by reincarnating up and up and up and up and up to a higher caste until eventually you can reach moksha. But in Buddhism, all you need to do is meditate and um, understand the truth of the world, which is something anyone can do, no matter where you are in society. And then you can attain nirvana, which is similar to moksha. So the Buddha became aware of the true nature of the world. And he became aware of this, this true nature in the form of the four noble truths. Again, that's the four noble truths. He then became a missionary. He then sought to teach others about these truths. We'll get to what those are in a second. But all you need to know is that for the rest of his life, he traveled around India, gaining followers and teaching about his new way that he called the Middle Path. If you take a look, there's a little picture at the bottom with the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree meditating. If you turn to the next page, section three of this lecture is about Buddhist beliefs. Many beliefs in Buddhism are similar to Hinduism. For example, in Buddhism, you have karma, you have dharma, you have reincarnation, you have samsara, you have the idea of moksha and nirvana, all of those ideas in Buddhism come right out of Hinduism. But there are a couple big differences, three in particular I want to talk about. The first is that Buddhism is atheistic. That means that it has no god or gods. Second, humans in Buddhism do not have souls. Humans do not have souls that are separate from one another. In Hinduism, you have a soul that moves from one body to another, and then to another. It goes on and on. It's called your Atman. In Christianity, in Islam and Judaism, each human being has a soul, has some kind of a spirit that might go to heaven or hell after they die. But in Buddhism, people don't have souls. And this is point one here. Every being is one with the universe. Let me repeat that again. Every being is one with the universe. And the issue is that most people falsely believe that they are separate from everything else. They say, I am me and you are you. And that is that. But this is just an illusion, according to Buddhism. According to Buddhism, everyone and everything is connected. And we're going to talk a lot more about this in the days to come. But the key thing you need to know is that in Buddhism, human beings do not have souls. And every being is just a part of the universe. The third difference between Buddhism and Hinduism is that in Buddhism, every human can reach nirvana. Not just Brahmins. Again, every human can reach nirvana, not just Brahmins. Another key set of Buddhist beliefs are the Four Noble Truths. Those are the truths that the Buddha discovered while he was meditating under the Bodhi tree. And I'll go through them in order. The first noble truth is that life is full of suffering. This could be physical suffering, such as illness, hunger, old age, even death is a form of physical suffering. It could also be mental suffering, such as stress, anxiety, sadness, grief, when someone dies. All of those are examples of suffering, and that's just a key, according to Buddhism, the first noble truth. That is just a key part of life. The second noble truth gives us the reason 
why people suffer, according to the Buddha. And according to the Buddha, people suffer because they crave things. Crave is spelled C-R-A-V-E. To crave means to want. And in life, people crave all kinds of things. Objects, money, love, youth, food, video games. In Buddhism, these are called attachments. If you did not want them, you would not be suffering because you do not have them. That's the key idea. The only reason why you're suffering is because you want things that you don't have. And if you did not want them, you would not be suffering. The third noble truth, and here's the good news, according to the Buddha, is that there is a way to be free of suffering. Just because you're a human doesn't mean you have to suffer. And the fourth noble truth is that that way is called the Noble Eightfold Path. I want to go through the Noble Eightfold Path a little bit. There are sort of three parts of the path. There's The first part is about wisdom. The second part is about ethical conduct, and that means acting morally. And the third part is about concentration. And each of these parts have two or three of the folds or factors of the path, of the Eightfold Path. When we talk about wisdom, what does the Eightfold Path mean? Well, the first thing it means is right view. And that means to follow the Eightfold Path, you need to view reality as it is, not just as it appears to be. So reality appears to be all these different beings, all these different human beings that are separate from another and separate from the trees and the garden and separate from the cars and the street and separate from the road and the sidewalk and the rock and the alligator and the armadillo. But according to Buddhism, you need to have the right view. That means seeing that all of these things are just a part of something bigger, just like atoms are part of a molecule or molecules are part of an organism. Everything is part of something bigger, and they're not really separate. The second thing in terms of wisdom that you need, and this is the second part of the Noble Eightfold Path, is right intention. And that means that you have decided that it is your goal to reach enlightenment, that you have decided that I, you are pushing yourself to reach nirvana. Now we move into the section about ethical conduct or moral actions. And in Buddhism, there are three types of moral actions. There is right speech, which means speaking in a way that's truthful, always telling the truth, not lying. And speaking in a way that's not hurtful, avoiding saying things that might be hurtful to other people. The second part of acting morally is right action. That means actually doing things that don't hurt people. Trying to avoid causing harm to another living being. The fifth way is right livelihood. That means not making your livelihood, your living, off of the pain of other people. The third part of the Eightfold Path is concentration, and this includes items six, seven, and eight on the path. The sixth is right effort. That means you, tr you have the right intention, you do the right actions, but sometimes you're going to fail, sometimes you're going to mess up. And right effort means that even if you mess up, you make an effort to improve yourself, to try to be less harmful to other people and to try to say less harmful things. The seventh part of the path is right mindfulness. And that means that you are constantly paying attention to see things as they are and not just as they appear to be. And it also means that you're constantly aware of the present reality within oneself. You're not living in the past. You're not living in the future. You're just living in the right now. And that also means living without any craving. So instead of saying, I am hungry, you separate yourself from your body and you can say, my body is hungry right now. And just because your body is hungry doesn't mean that you have to crave food. You can, say, you can separate yourself and say, oh, my body wants food. 
I don't have to be hungry, and there you don't have to suffer. The final part is right concentration, and that means meditating or concentrating. We're going to talk about meditation once we get to practices. In Buddhism, if you follow this path, then you will attain nirvana and be free of samsara. The final section, section four of this lecture, is about Buddhist practices. The first one is devotion. And that means bowing, making offerings, undergoing pilgrimages, or reciting mantras. Those are chants that you repeat over and over in front of statues of the Buddha. The second practice of Buddhism is moral behavior. As we talked about before in the Eightfold Path, this means no violence, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no drugs. The third part, the third main practice, and this is the practice that is probably most commonly associated with Buddhism, is meditation. And there's sort of two purposes of meditation. One purpose is clearing the mind in an effort to not think about anything. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it's actually really hard to not think about anything. If you try to do it, you'll just notice that things just keep popping into your mind, and it's really hard to just keep your mind thinking about just nothing, nothing at all. The second purpose of meditation is, to contem is contemplating the truth of the world seeing beyond the illusions and thinking about the reality of how everything is connected. There are many ways to meditate. The most popular is sitting. Perhaps this could be in the lotus position, which we'll talk about a little bit in the next couple weeks. The second way that many people meditate is walking. A third way is that some Buddhist monks have at, have said, suggested that you can even meditate while you are driving. And a fourth way, and this kind of connects to Hinduism a little, is that you can meditate while doing yoga. Another Buddhist practice is reading the sutras. These are the core texts of, of Buddhism. A Buddhist might interact with monks if they have some questions about their lives, or how to follow the Dharma. And monks are Buddhist leaders. Finally, Buddhists may also go to temples to worship. Just like Hindus go to temples, Buddhists go to temples as well. That was the lecture. Circle, remember to circle any of the blanks that you were not able to fill out, and you can ask your substitute teacher who will give you the answers to what goes in those blanks. Additionally, you can write down any questions you have about Buddhism in the space below, and I'll give you some time when I return tomorrow to ask me those questions. Have a great rest of your day.